All right, so good morning, everybody, and welcome to day four of our Epic Oceans Week Canada celebration here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. We've got some new teachers joining us on YouTube. We've got some first-timers joining us live on StreamYard, and so a huge welcome to all our educators from across Canada and the United States as we continue to celebrate science, conservation, and adventure, especially with a big focus on oceans for this Epic Oceans Week celebration. We have done half of our series of eight amazing programs with scientists and explorers from across Canada, and today we are starting our second half of that with two great programs today and two more tomorrow to wrap us up. So, if you're keen to check those out, you can always head to our YouTube channel at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants and see all our past broadcasts. We have over 2,500 sessions with scientists and explorers worldwide there for you to peruse as you like. And of course, if you want to see about our upcoming programs for Oceans Week, check out oceanweekcan.ca. Not only are our programs at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants listed there, but a whole slew of other amazing events, programs, and resources to keep learning going for your love of oceans and the natural world. So I really encourage you to check out that site it's your one-stop shop for all sorts of great stuff. Now, without further ado, we are joined by Jennifer Putland and Monica Pels, who are with Ocean Networks Canada's K-12 education team. They are awesome. I'm so excited to finally have them in a broadcast with me because we've been emailing for years. And so you guys are in for a real treat as we are going to learn about discoveries from the deep today. So we're going to dive into some really cool ocean topics. I'm very excited. I got a little sneak peek of the presentation. So you guys are in for a real treat today. Without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, Jennifer and Monica. And take us away, ladies. <laughs> Well, thanks for having us and, and good morning, everyone. Um, we're totally excited to be with you today um, and welcome to our presentation. My lovely colleague, Monica, is going to share our screen with you right now. Wants to share, thinking about it. <laughs> oh, uh, I think I... We did this in test five times. This is half the fun of being put on the spot with screen sharing. <laughs> I, I get to do this all day long. So it's very fun. Oh, there it is. It came up. Beautiful. So we'll go back. We'll, we'll reverse the clock. Monica is going to share the screen right now. Perfect. Oh, there it is. Fantastic. So hello and welcome to our presentation on discoveries from the deep. Before we get into this today, we would like to acknowledge our host nations. Yes, we acknowledge with respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the university stands and the Songhees, Esquimalt and Wissanic peoples whose historical relationship with the land continue to this day. Uh, my family is a settler family, so I have to acknowledge, of course, that um, this land has been occupied for millennia and we are all guests on this land. And I'm excited that uh, the University of Victoria is working to have a positive uh, ongoing relationship uh, with the Indigenous peoples who've lived on this land, their knowledge, their citizen science, their observations um, are very important to our work and we need to acknowledge this with respect where we are. Absolutely. Um, so thank you. Um, who are we? Um, again, my name is Jennifer Petland and um, I have a background in ocean science and um, I've actually turned into an ocean educator. Um, and I'm joining you from the unceded territory of the Wissanich people. And I'm Monica. Um, I have a collection of funny hats, though this one didn't survive much longer than the day, but I do, I miss it. I think of it fondly. And uh, I am also on the unceded territory of the Wissanich peoples. Um, and of course, I have to share my favorite animal. My favorite animal is the Nautilus, which is an ocean animal. What's your favorite ocean animal, Jennifer? You know what? I think this is always a hard question for me, um, but I think in honor of Father's Day that is um, right around the corner, I'm going to say the seahorse. And that's because the seahorse fathers, they, um, they hold on to the little eggs and they do that for about up to 45 days. And I think they're pretty cool too. They're pretty um, elaborate. They can be very elaborate and I think they look pretty cute. Seahorses are an excellent choice. All right, I'm going to give you just a quick overview of Ocean Networks Canada, and I do want to emphasize the word quick. Uh, Jennifer and I both work as education coordinators for Ocean Networks Canada. Ocean Networks Canada is a nonprofit that's based at the University of Victoria, and its primary mission is to monitor physics, chemistry, geology, and ocean properties 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, uh, with multiple sites throughout Canada. 
Um, the data from these sites is used to help better understand the ocean so that in a nutshell, we can protect it and ourselves. Um, if you'd like to have a more specific presentation about all the science we do at ONC, we are very happy to accommodate that. Um, just reach out to us at, at Ocean Networks and we'll make that happen for you. Um, but I'm just going to give you the quick version because we have about 500 instruments with about 4,000 different parameters bringing in a terabyte of data every single day. Uh, that would take the rest of this presentation to just scratch the surface. And it is very interesting but it's not what we're going to talk about today. Awesome. Thank you, Monica. Okay, so you've seen this uh, picture probably 100 times already in your life. Um, this is our beautiful planet, our blue marble. And as you can see, it's covered in water. And a lot of that water is, is salt water. And um, hang on for a minute there, <laughs> Monica. Um, yeah, and about 75% 70 of the, um, the surface of our planet is covered in seawater. And that, that ocean is deep too. So it's about, on average, it's about four kilometers deep. And what we know about this um, ocean of ours, this amazing ocean of ours, is that it's a life support system. It's a source of water oxygen every second breath we take that oxygen comes from the ocean doesn't matter where you are on the planet that oxygen was made from the ocean um, it's a source of food and natural products which help us make medicines and it regulates our um, our climate too, make sure that we don't get too hot and burn up and we know so much more about this place um, you know, the knowledge that we've acquired is actually pretty enormous when you consider the fact um, that we've only discovered about 20% of this place. Um, yeah, thank you. <coughs> I have allergies today. It's also my first day at work, apparently, figuring out these slides. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we only have discovered about 20% of our oceans. 80% are unmapped unobserved, unexplored. So ocean discovery is actually still in its infancy. And it's it's really important. Um, as I said, it's the ocean is um, our life support system on our planet. And it's actually under threat from pollution, overfishing, um, habitat loss, and climate change. And so ocean discovery is actually really important for us to better understand this ocean, this life support system, so that we, hang on a second, <laughs> go back, um, can better protect it and manage it. And so that's for, you know, protecting and managing it is for its health and also for ours, because we do depend, as I said, on the ocean. So ocean discoveries yeah, um, happen through two primary ways. Um, one of them is through research from scientists and also um, observations by citizen scientists and youth just like you. If you could just advance that a little bit there, uh, Monica. Now, it's important to note that Indigenous people have been living in harmony with the ocean for millennia, and they have made many observations um, about the ocean. And as we include that shared knowledge, we, uh, it just enriches our, our understanding of the ocean. Um, if you wanted to play that video, it's really neat. And this was an observation that was made relatively recent, uh, recently off of our coast here in the Pacific Ocean. And it's actually a salmon shark that they um, observed rubbing against this log And you'll see in the footage, there's a bunch of barnacles on that log. So we know barnacles are really hard and scratchy things. Um, and you'll see that there's what looks like little tags on the dorsal fin of the shark. Those are parasites. And so what we observed, the scientists on board the ship um, observed was that this salmon shark was rubbing up against that log, um, presumably to remove those parasites. So parasites, uh, when they build up like that on uh, an animal, like a shark, they really reduce the efficiency of, of, of swimming. So 
neat observation. So today what we're gonna do um, is we're gonna be looking at um, and one ocean discovery that was made by research scientists, if you could go back, Monica. Yeah, thanks. Um, so we're gonna be looking at one ocean discovery made by research um, from scientists. And we're gonna look at how Canadian scientists are contributing to that ocean discovery. And then Monica is gonna um, talk a little bit about some discoveries that were made by Yay. citizen scientists and youth. Okay, so if you could go ahead uh, and just stay on that one. Yeah, so um, when we talk about mountains, um, probably the first thing that I think of when people talk about mountains is these things that we ski down or maybe we hike up them or maybe we look at them from afar with inspiration. But in fact, if you could advance this slide, there are mountains that are under the ocean and they can be really big. Um, these mountains under the ocean um, are called seamounts and what they are are submarine um, extinct volcanoes. And they're at least about a, a kilometer in height, but they can get really big. They can get to be about six kilometers in height, which is really big considering uh, the biggest mountain on our planet is Mount Everest and it's about nine kilometers um, in height. So we've actually known about these uh, seamounts for quite some time now. And it's at, right now it's estimated that there's about 100,000 of them on our seafloor. And, uh, but we're learning about them all the time and discovering them. And sometimes we discover um, <laughs> them in, in strange ways. Uh, and if you could just advance the slide there. Yeah, this is actually a submarine um, that ran into uh, a seamount. So, uh, so this is because, you know, it's difficult to map the ocean floor. Um, and actually, it's, it's estimated that only less than 10% of the ocean floor has been mapped. So that's why we see things like this happening. All right, just advance the slide there. So now we'll, we've known about these um, seamounts for quite some time. It's actually relatively recent that we've um, started to discover and study the life that lives around them and on them. And what we've discovered is that they're biological hotspots. So what does that mean? So that basically means that in and around these seamounts, there are high abundances and growth rates of animals and plants for that matter. And, um, and there's a high biodiversity. That means there's a lot of species that live in and around these seamounts. And so sort of an analogy that I can think about is that um, let's just say that you were you know, walking through a desert and you came across a mountain and that mountain is really um, a complex um, entity. And on that mountain, um, you know, you could find little tiny um, homes um, or nice homes for that matter. Um, and you can also find your favorite foods. Maybe there's a delicatessen or a bread shop or your favorite coffee shop, um, a grocery store. So what I'm saying is that these um, seamounts, they do attract um, a lot of marine life, marine mammals, if you could advance the slide. I'm having a hard time deciding if I wanted to go to Starbucks or Dunkin' first. I, I, was, I was distracted. I'm sorry. That's okay. Shall I play this one right away? Yeah, go right ahead. Uh, so they're hot spots of, of activity and they attract marine mammals, um, birds, seabirds. Um, he used them as feeding grounds and nursery grounds. So this is a close up of um, AC Mount, just showing the diversity of life that lives. Um, as I said, in and around the seamount. Now, if you could go to the next slide, um, it shows the 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 animals that. Um, oh, this there one. We go. Yeah. yeah. So lots of fish, uh, mammals, uh, seabirds. They they will come and visit uh, these seamounts. Um, because they like they feed uh, on um, all different types of organisms that live in and around the, the seamounts, and they use them as nursery grounds too. So um, there are high abundances, if you could go to the next slide, of fish that live on these seamounts. Um, and these are just a few examples, halibut on the top left there, 
Um, the right is a rockfish and the bottom is a sable fish. And lots of these fish live on seamounts and um, they've been targeted by commercial fisheries. And unfortunately, if you could go to the next slide, thank you. Um, the tools that they use to fish for these fish species are very destructive to the seamount ecosystems. They literally um, kill everything in their way and destroy it. And recovery from this kind of destruction um, can take quite a long time, usually more than five years. Um, and this is because of the fact of uh, the destruction of the slow growing habitat forming species that live on the seamounts. And as a result of that, these uh, seamounts are considered vulnerable marine ecosystems. Can you go to the next slide? All right. All right. So in Canada, we have seamounts. The only seamounts that we um, have are actually on the Pacific coast. Um, and as of today, it's estimated that we have 62 seamounts. And you can see the region um, denoted here on the left panel with all the little triangles and dots. Those, each one of those represents um, a seamount. So the Canadian government is actually committed to the protection of these seamounts. Um, and just, you know, they're vulnerable marine ecosystems and they're home to many species um, and a high abundance of species. They're nursery grounds, they're fish um, um, foraging grounds. And so um, they're committed to the protection of these um, seamounts. Now, and for example, in 2017, the Canadian government banned bottom contact fishing on all seamounts. All right, could you go to the next slide? Um, so the, all, the government is also intending to create a whole network of marine protected um, areas off of our coastline to help protect these uh, seamounts. Um, and this requires an understanding of what is there because you can't protect and manage what you don't know. And so um, the mission is then to work in collaboration with First Nations and um, to, find, uh, to find these seamounts, uh, understand uh, their physical characteristics, map their locations and um, document the species that occur on these seamounts. Uh, their abundances, um, and uh, the diversity of species. All right, go to the next one. Now, as you can imagine, this is actually quite um, a difficult job to do. Um, and an analogy is, um, imagine yourself going to a mountain that's twice the size of Whistler Mountain. When you show this, you see, this is actually Whistler Mountain. Um, in this uh, little video here. So imagine yourself going to Whistler Mountain, a mountain twice the size of Whistler, and having um, to identify all the species, um, their distributions across this mountain. All right, and do this 62 times because there's 62 seamounts, and, and then do it in the dark and do it underwater and do it with a really small remote controlled uh, camera system. And that is an analogy of what is happening off our coast here. And what you can see in the bottom right panel figure here is actually the uh, remote control system that they use um, to observe these species and these seamounts. All right. And yes, it has worked. They have done this on previous expeditions successfully and they've discovered 40 seamounts and they produce high resolution images um, of the seamounts like you see in this uh, little video here. And they've identified species, including new species, and they've mapped their abundances and their distributions. If you go to the next one here, yeah, this is pretty cool. They have found this whole garden of sponges and some of these sponges, um, they can live for a very long time, thousands of years. So all of this information that they've collected is really what we call baseline information so that we can better understand how these um, seamounts are impacted 
not just by fishing, but also by climate change as well. And all of that will help us to better protect and manage them. So all of these previous expeditions have focused on shallow seamounts. And um, so this next is expedition, um, if you could go to the next slide, um, which is starting in just a few days, is gonna be focusing in on deep sea mounts. And those are shown um, in all those circles right there. Um, if you wish to follow this expedition, and I encourage you to do so because there's gonna be some, probably some really neat things that they find in terms of species. They're gonna be observing behaviors among species as well. Um, you can follow the expedition at hashtag Pacific Seamounts 2021. Um, and you can also follow it on our website at oceannetworks.ca uh, Pacific Seamounts 2021. All right, I'm going to hand it over to Monica. So she's going to talk about discoveries by citizen scientists and youth. Thank you. And I'll just actually add one tiny little thing about that uh, Seamounts expedition. Um, they'll be live streaming as well, so you can follow along with that. And it's just kind of cool. You get to check in and hear from, from scientists as it happens. Um, as Jennifer said, though, I'm going to change the tone a little bit because um, citizen scientists are actually hugely important to scientists. And, and I grabbed these definitions. Um, a scientist is someone who engages in scientific work in collaboration um, with instructions. And then they said that a citizen science is an amateur scientist, but I, I actually, I don't like that. I, I prefer the term a scientist because a scientist is a person who conducts research to advance uh, knowledge in an area of interest. And as far as I can tell, that applies to anybody who's willing to stop, take a look around and make some observations. Um, I've include the, included these pictures because I thought it was really interesting that when you um, Google a search something like scientist, you get these folks in, you know, the lab coats, uh, working with petri dishes, microscopes, and I'm not saying that's not part of science, um, but there's so much more to science. I would say that the portion of time that you're in a lab is actually really, really limited. Most of the science that you do is going to be out on the land doing observations or looking at information as it comes to you. And so I've got some examples here of how you can be a citizen scientist, or again, as I like to say, a scientist, um, just at home. So a couple of them are digital, and then of course, one of them is physical. And, and this picture down on the bottom, uh, left-hand side, these are citizen scientists in the Arctic. And they, again, are um, mostly Indigenous folks who are living up in the Arctic Circle. We actually can't do science without them. We don't have the capacity to be up in the Arctic every day of the year, understanding what's going on. Um, but they live there. This is their life. This is what they do. And so having their observations and their assistance is pivotal to understanding changes in the Arctic, which the Arctic is changing um, quickly than anywhere else on the planet. And we can't capture that or protect it without the help of citizen scientists. Um, but like I said, there's also two other ways that you can engage. So one of them, um, this top picture here on the computer, that is a program called Digital Fishers. And Digital Fishers is a video game-like system that Ocean Networks Canada uses where we actually ask the public to help us identify when something is in a video. So I mentioned that we have about 500 instruments and about 4,000 different sensors. We have somewhere in the neighborhood of 200, 200 250,000 hours of video. And that video comes from the seafloor. And what you do in um, SeaTube is you help researchers determine if there is anything happening. So if you look at this picture down at the bottom, um, that is one such instance where someone discovered something happening. Um, so this little clip happened here and it was actually discovered by someone who was 12 years old in the Ukraine. They sent us a note said, um, what is this? And it started a huge search for information that we didn't know uh, we didn't know before. I'm going to show you a couple more examples. So again, see something, you got to ask. So this is a crab migration that was spotted by a citizen scientist. Um, and this, again, was something that had never been seen before. That's not a crab migration. That's our researcher. I'm going to skip ahead, though, because I want to just see the cool part. So this is what our citizen science scientists saw. And uh, what I want you to observe 
go away, is that there are thousands of crabs. Not only that, there are a huge number of sizes. These lasers right here, the two little red dots, I hope you can see my pointer, they're about 10 centimeters apart. So you can see that we've got some really massive crabs. We've also got some really tiny crabs. And I'll give you a hint, right about here in the middle, you're going to see that one of them actually gets blown over. He does like a little backflip. So again, this tells us that there's a huge amount of current. You can see the particulate in the water. And for whatever reason, despite all the, um, all of the strong current, despite the fact that crabs sometimes will eat smaller uh, members of their own species, these crabs have somewhere to go and they're going to get there. They're all marching together for whatever re reason they're headed off to try and figure this out. We actually never did, or I shouldn't say never, we haven't yet figured out um, where they were going or what they were doing, um, but it was the first time that a migration like this has ever been seen. And one of the things that we depend on for citizen scientists is to not only alert us that this happened, but to give us uh, an alert if it happens again. If you would like to hear uh, from Fabio, the scientist, um, you can also jump over to our YouTube channel. Um, I was just aware of our time, but this video is mystery caught on camera and it's on our YouTube and you can check that out and you can hear from Fabio, who's a really uh, neat fella. Now, of course, there are other instances of citizen science as well, which confirms, oh, come on you. Um, which confirms what we assume or guess. For example, we know that fish prey on one another. Um, we know that there's a food chain going on. Um, but again, this citizen scientist was watching uh, the camera and happened to spot this behavior. Bye-bye. So there you go, a sable fish coming in and getting a little snack. So again, we know that they are predatory, but here is direct evidence of feeding. And one of the things that I think is really amazing, which was spotted by a citizen scientist, is how quickly that fish was consumed. And the reason why that's important is if we look at this video, which again, citizen scientists alerting to something happening, what you're going to see is attempted feeding behavior. And you'll see why I call it attempted in one moment here. So similar area, it's about 100 meters deeper. And oh, and actually, I'm just going to uh, say one more thing, actually. Notice that there's uh, very few crabs. Again, this was the same area. This is what we normally expect for crabs, just to give you an idea of how unusual that migration really is. But anyway, back to business. Uh, Citizen Science was watching along and check this out. That uh, that poor rat tail, he looks like a meme. Look at his little face. Um, this is again where we observed that the sable fish had captured this rat tail. But what I think is really interesting is there we see the sable fish. He's got it. He does a quick roll. We actually don't know if the rat tail got away because, again, the rat tail um, or the sable fish carries him out of frame. And so we don't know if it got away or not. With that citizen science video that I showed you the first time, we think that they actually feed fairly quickly. So there is a chance that this rat tail survived. And again, this is something to think about um, as a, an observer kind of whose side are you on? Are you interested in what the sable fish did or the rat tail did? These are all pieces of information that have come from citizen scientists. Come on. And of course, citizen scientists help us um, observe behaviors that we don't normally see because these um, cameras are a window into the world. Now I am going to play this one with sound because I do happen to think that the sound makes it better. So I'm just going to play this one for you and share the observations that were made. So again, there we had some um, observations that were um, 
believed to occur but not well understood. So again, a crab fight. Crabs are not known to fight when there's no food around um, or there's no resources. And again, in this video, we don't see a lot of resources, but for whatever reason, these crabs are having a, uh, a little tete-a-tete, -tete. they're having a little square off. And so again, this is all stuff that's been brought to our attention by citizen scientists. Come on. Um, where can you become a citizen scientist? How can you do this? If you head over to Ocean Networks Canada's webpage, um, we have live data sites and data previews. And so the one that I've grabbed for you is from Kitimat Village. So again, you can head over to Ocean Networks and have a look at what re what's really happening. When you get there, you're going to see several pieces of information, which again, this all counts as citizen science. You've got things like air temperature, solar radiation, um, and I will show you that actually uh, solar radiation was at zero, and the reason for that is 11, or sorry, 2310, that's 11 o'clock at night. It is, of course, dark at night um, when I happen to take this screenshot, but there's some really interesting things going on here. For example, the water temperature is almost 10 degrees Celsius. Um, there's quite a lot of pressure, which means that the tide is in. And the, unfortunately, we can see that the oxygen health isn't that great. We tell you the health of our instruments. So again, that may be because, again, I'm going to show you the video from there. There could be a lot of particulate in the water. There's also a weather station. So again, you can see that the weather changed really significantly um, when I grabbed this data set. And here is, of course, the live video. So again, I just downloaded this and I put this up here as a citizen scientist, let me make it full screen, you may spot something that's never been seen before. So here we've got a, a, a probably a Dungeness crab and some different fish moving around. Again, this is, there's lots going on here depending on what we have time to observe. I promise I won't send, show you the whole five minute clip. I'm just gonna scrub ahead a little bit. Our crab is still hanging out. And actually here comes another crab which in full honesty, I actually just noticed that I downloaded this video yesterday and watched it through and I didn't even notice. And look at that, we've got two crabs again. So maybe a little bit later in this video, there'll be another crab fight and I can, I myself can contribute to citizen science, which I think is pretty cool. Alrighty, come on. So now it's your turn to ask us some questions. We threw a lot of information at you really quickly, um, but we hope that we've inspired you not only to be a citizen scientist, but to engage in some of these uh, expeditions as they happen, either as an observer or as a citizen science observer. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so I can actually see you. Fantastic. Well, ladies, what a rapid fire tour. We got to explore so much. He's some awesome imagery from deep sea. So thank you for that. Uh, discoveries of the deep indeed. And we have well over 400 kids tuning in from across North America. So welcome into all our students. A lot of Ontarians, Californians today, which is really exciting. Uh, and so thank you guys so, so much for joining us live and on YouTube alike. We're going to start with a question from one of our live classes, our first time ever for or this teacher joining us live. So Miss Law, if you want to come on in, and kick us off with a question, you are good to go. <laughs> hey, Ms. Log. Okay, great. I'm here. Um, my first question is, what's a crab's lifespan? Uh, it really depends on the species, actually. So uh, some crabs are really quite long-lived. Uh, the, the deeper and colder the water, the longer the crab will live. So for example, um, Alaskan king crab or uh, Japanese spider crabs will live a very long time. I don't know the exact numbers, but I feel like it's probably um, pushing like maybe even 50 years. Jennifer, do you know? Oh, Jennifer, you're uh, muted. <laughs> Come out and mute. There we go. Someone had to be muted at some point during every video broadcast. It's actually obligatory at this point. Yeah, go. no, I, I, exactly. No, I think that uh, Monica's right. As you go deeper down into the ocean, um, what ends up happening is that um, animals slow down their growth rates. And so they tend to be older and they are, tend to be more vulnerable then as well. It takes a long time for them to develop and be reproductive um but the exact numbers off the top of my head uh, oh. <laughs> yeah. years, maybe but i don't know if it's beyond a few years i know that uh with dungeness and red rock crab that you eat it takes them several years to be eat 
edible size, eatable size, <laughs> edible size. Though, so they're usually a couple years old at that point. Um, but again, they're so delicious that that uh, limits their lifespan once we we get a hold of them. This isn't a crab question, but we had Boris Worm on earlier the week for sharks, and one of the big things a lot of our kids know is that Greenland sharks are really old. So we confirmed that we we confirmed they're over four hundred years old and reach maturity, and over a hundred, we're pretty sure, which is wild. So long after most people will ever be alive, they're just getting to the stage where they can start having young, which is just mind blowing. So deep sea. <laughs> Well, and another thing about crabs is not all of them are so obvious. Uh, the one that comes to mind is the Puget Sound king crab. A Puget Sound king crab um, is wearing a suit of armor, and they actually disappear into the landscape. And so one of the reasons we don't know how long they live is because it's really hard to go back and find the same one you saw last year and the year before and the year before because they're so good at camouflaging. So there's really, it's really difficult to know what, how old something is. Yeah. All right, I just did a quick search for you. The Japanese spider crab, maybe, maybe the longest lived at 100 years. There you go. By the way, I encourage all our students to look up Japanese spider crabs because they are truly incredible creatures, one of my favorite uh, invertebrates in the world. Uh, thanks, Ms. Law, for kicking us off with such a great conversation. Now, Ms. McCallum joining us in Saskatoon, you have your uh, mic on, so you should be able to hear you if you have a question for us. And if not, you can share in the chat. Let's see. Yeah, um, I did type it in chat. One of my students wants to know if small sharks eat uh, um, big things like other sharks. I think I think the rule with sharks is mouth size. So if it fits in your mouth, you'll pretty much give it a try. Um, generally, again, there's so many different types of sharks, it's hard to say. Uh, for example, I, th I think of the cookie cutter shark. A cookie cutter shark is so called because it actually has a perfectly round bite and it will swim up to things that are much, much bigger than it. And it will take a cookie cutter bite out of that creature and then swim off. Um, so it, it sort of depends on what kind of shark you mean. Um, there's also things like the mega mouth shark, which is an extremely deep water shark where we're not sure exactly what it eats, but its mouth is mega. So we assume it eats really big things. We've, uh, there was a recent post of a mega mouth shark. Someone caught one on film for the first time in ages, and it really looks like a shark that was drawn by a kindergartner. It's amazing. It's got the best face. So I, I encourage you guys, Japanese spider crab, mega mouth shark. Check these out when you're done. Um, Jennifer, our next question will come to you in a minute. Um, Ms. McNamara's class, they're joining us in Gray and Bruce counties. I've got family there in Ontario. They want to know, what do the crabs fight about? Tell us a little bit more about these crabs and what's going on. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, so it's like what Monica said, that um, animals will fight. They're not, so fighting, in terms of um, anything that an animal does, it, it's, it's an energetic um issue and so they don't want to fight if they don't have to fight and so um in this particular case uh you, you know they'll fight over food right uh, because they don't want to lose a nice morsel of food that they could um grow and be stronger right with so they're going to fight over food and they also fight over territory if, it, if territory is important for them um, and they're also going to fight over um, mating, right? So those are the three big ones, um, you know, in, in general, why animals fight. Um, with respect to crabs specifically, I don't think that there's, you know, exceptions to that. I think they're probably very similar in that regard. Um, as I said, they're not going to fight if they don't have to because it takes energy to fight. Yeah. I ordered a pizza the other day. Someone went to take a slice and that was, just, you know, reason enough for me. So I, I feel the, the crabs uh, pain there. Um, guys, we've got time for about four more questions with our live groups. Unfortunately for our YouTube groups, I'm going to pass along resources at the end. I know we're, we're going a little long with this broadcast because we are rebels without a cause um, or with a good cause. We're going to learn about OSHA today, which is fantastic. Um, but I want to head to Algonquin Elementary uh, next in Sterling, Virginia. So Ms. Karn's class, if you guys want to come on in, unmute that mic. We'll be good to go for a question, and I know you shared one in the chat as well, but if you want to say it live? Yes. Hi there. Hi there. Oh, that I'll show you the class, sorry. Hey, a full class. Hi. 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 Sorry. So, yeah, do you have a question for us? Yeah, so my students have quite a few questions. My first student, she's going to ask real quick. Um, how do crabs survive in such deep waters? 
how do crabs survive in deep waters? This is my favorite. It, they're wearing a suit of armor, actually. So we call it a shell or an exoskeleton, um, but they survive because they've got that suit to keep them from getting crushed. Um, it also keeps them from being stung. They've got these really fancy claws on the front. Um, so one of the ways that they survive is just by being really hardy and really um, well adapted to where their um, species likes to live. So for example, hydrothermal vent crabs, they are adapted to have pressure keep their innards inside their shell. And they've got these really long pencil-like claws so that they can pull food out of the hydrothermal vent. So basically, adaptations is the way that they're surviving in all these places. We should all find something in our lives that we are as excited about as you are about crabs. We've never had more crab crabs <laughs> in any broadcast in history, so way to go. Yeah. Well, you know, I get this excited about anything because this is all new. And so, and these are all things that kids and citizen scientists has helped us discover. Um, my least favorite animal on the planet was the hagfish until I found out how interesting they are. So, so cool. you know, we, you just, I, I have to have my mind changed by science all the time. Okay, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna make up a, a rolling list of uh, creatures here in our chat bar, but um, hagfish are awesome. And when creatures attack hagfish, you can look this up on YouTube. You got this like, it looks like a slimy eel it's in the bottom of the ocean and if something attacks it, it basically like unleashes a whole bunch of mucus. So if you think of the mucus you have, but imagine like a thousand times that and it like gums up the mouth of a shark or anything that's trying to attack it. They're so cool. They're also basically the first thing to arrive at any dead animal that lands in the bottom of the ocean. The hagfish are there first. They can smell it from so far away. Super, super cool cool creatures. Um, so yes, these are things we're getting very excited about, guys. This is awesome. Um, Miss Truscott, joining us in Markham, grade four or five. So you want to come on in, just unmute that mic and you're good to go. Hey, Miss Truscott. Hello, thank you. Uh, my students are all at home. They were very jealous to see there was a class back in person. We we're finishing the year off remotely, but we have a few questions. Um, we've been learning about rocks and minerals. Are there any minerals that are common in those sea mountains and does that affect the creatures around and and um i'm trying to combine some things so see what we can do how yeah. about how many creatures when you're researching might you see in a day around a sea mount and has there been anything mysterious found through this research yeah go ahead jennifer that's a great question yeah i didn't talk about uh i talked about the fishing and how it's destructive but um in fact, uh, mining is uh, quite um, destructive as well. And seamounts are actually um, potential sites for mining um, because of their uh, volcanic past. Uh, they have many different minerals and um, metals that are of interest um, to um, tech companies <laughs> specifically, all these devices that we use. Um, they require uh, metals and minerals. Uh, metals uh, like cobalt is one of them that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, and so we need to think of the fact that um, those types of, oper those industries, um, they may um, in the future want to mine these sea, these sea mounts, which are vulnerable ecosystems. Um, now, as far as I think you were asking a, um, a couple of things, um, Unusual species, I think you asked. Um, yeah, uh, from what I understand, um, past they have seen some interesting species on these seamounts off the coast of Canada. Um, they have seen dolphins, um, southern dolphins come up. Um, because of climate change, our waters, we've had um, a big blob of warm water off of our coast. Um, in fact, it was called the blob. And what it did is it brought southern species um, up into our waters. And so we've seen a lot of southern species and in our waters, including in and around um, sea mounts. Um, did I catch all of those questions? I think that's perfect. And Ms. Truscott, if you do have more, email them to us. We'll make sure that Jennifer and Monica get the chance to answer them. I know we've got more questions than we can shake a stick at today, which is the best possible problem to have. <laughs> uh, two quick notes on your cell phone. This is actually something that we hear in marine and terrestrial ecosystem conversations. 
Recycle your cell phones. It's actually quite incredible how many rare minerals go into these things, and whether you want to protect gorillas in the rainforest, seamounts, all sorts of places. Um, there are lots of programs. A lot of zoos have them. IKEA actually has a really, really good one. And a lot of municipalities have ways that you can recycle these electronics, and it really does help protect ecosystems that we're learning about in these programs. So really encourage you guys to do that. Uh, if you're really keen on seamounts, too, we've done a bevy of programs in those, but two incredible ships you guys should look up, the RV Falcor and the EV Nautilus. We've done a ton of programs with these guys in the past, and they go out on expeditions to study seamounts and get some of this amazing imagery that we saw today. So I really encourage our classes to check out those programs on our channel as well. All right, guys, time for two more questions with our live groups. We've got so many live groups today. Uh, again, I'm going to add one thing to your, uh, uh, Jesse, I'm just going to add one thing. The Nautilus will actually be joining o Ocean Networks Canada this Ooh. summer for an expedition as well. So Ocean Networks Canada always has to do yearly maintenance on our network. Um, we've got electrical cables on the seafloor. They need a little TLC. And yeah. so we will be working with the Nautilus. And the Nautilus also does live questions and broadcast as well as you mentioned um, so again you can have a combination of um, uh, different things going on this summer you can check that out and that is available through Ocean Networks Canada's web page as well if you check out the Pacific Seamounts um, that will lead you to the other things as well um, so we've got lots of ways to connect we are not going to disappear after this unless of course you'd like us to um, we're around I've brought up that webpage for people to check out. And on that ship, if you need someone to shine people's shoes or get coffee from shore and coming back on the Zodiac every day, I'm your guy. Just give me a call. Um, very, very cool ships. And then well, how neat for you guys. What a neat opportunity. All right. Two more classes to wrap us up. So Miss Moore's class joining us also in Spring. Unmute that mic. Say a big hello. So nice to see kids in a class. Kim, hey, hey, hey Virginians. <laughs> Welcome in. So you have a question for us? We do. I was I had a question to ask. Um, in the last video, I think, what was this like? The white thing is floating around the camera. Great question. So the white stuff is what's known as marine snow uh, because it's white and it falls down. Um, but what it is, is all sorts of debris, um, little pieces of plankton, animal poop, all sorts of stuff basically that it would have come from the surface and it snows down on the ecosystem below. And so it's called marine snow. And a lot of creatures uh, feed on that because they either don't want to go to the surface to get phytoplankton, it's too dangerous for them or they can't. And so they wait for the, the dead phytoplankton to fall down to feed on. Um, or again, it's things like uh, other animals, uh, feces falling down. And again, something always wants to eat that, not me, but there's always something that wants to eat that. So it um, that's what we see. We also see things like um, bacteria and copepods and little marine worms. So it's it's kind of a smattering of everything and it's what supports um, those deep water ecosystems ecosystems, um, things like the abyssal plain, they don't get sunlight, so they don't have plants. Um, and so they depend on things falling from the surface to bring them their nutrition. So, so cool. I'm so glad we got the chance to bring this up. And I really encourage you guys to check out, we did a program with Hugh Griffiths, who's talked about some of the creatures that feed on that marine snow in Antarctic ecosystems. Feather stars are among them, one of the coolest, most otherworldly animals on this planet. They are so, so neat. Um, I, we could dirt out about this all day. Unfortunately, we're, we're quite long, so I want to make sure we get our last question in from Ms. Wojcik uh, in Delaware Central, joining us in Ontario near London. Uh, come on in, guys, and unmute your mic to wrap us up. Hey guys. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having us. This is awesome. Um, we've got a couple of questions from our class. I've got Mrs. Barnett's classes with us. We're kind of a combined five, six. Um, and you can hear me, right? Yep, yeah, we're fine. Go ahead. Okay. They can hear me. My my class that's watching through Google Meet says they, that I'm muted, but it's okay, guys. They can hear that's me. Okay. So, um, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so what is the weirdest but coolest animal you've ever seen um, or strangest? Um, just one second. I'm going to see if I unmute myself here, then my class can hear us too. Okay, there we go. So what is the weirdest but coolest or strangest animal you've ever seen? And our second question is, do sharks eat whales? You want to go first, Jennifer? Okay, my okay, I had an experience um, with a Humboldt squid. And it's a long story, but um, they're very common on, on along our coastline here, and they are fished. Um, 
but I got caught one and it's a long story and it's eyeball was about, I don't know if you can see my hands, about that big. It was huge. It was an epic story. Um, yeah, it's a long story, but I'm, I'm going to hand it over to Monica. Yes. Well, I'll very quickly answer the question, do sharks eat whales? They do if they're already dead. Um, so a dead whale is like the equivalent of a dead tree in the forest. Anything and everything will come in to feed on it. So do they hunt whales? No, but will they eat them if they get the opportunity? Absolutely. Um, and my strangest creature is called Phyromnia. And Phyromnia is a type of um, marine plankton that actually will use the body of a salp, which is a type of jellyfish type creature, as a cover. So it hunts a salp eats the insides and then puts the skin of the salp on and uses that to swim around. And it was actually the inspiration for the alien in the alien movies. My, the reason why I like it, it's actually smaller than my thumbnail. So I'm totally safe from it, even though it's like a really freaky looking creature. It, luckily it's, it's like this big. You're the first person ever to mention that as your favorite feature. They are so cool. Um, what a neat thing. We'll try and get that. If kids don't know, again, check out oceannetworks.ca. You can always reach out to the folks here. They're doing such amazing work and you can highlight this. But if you look up the creature that's the inspiration for Alien, you will find this. My favorite parasite, there's something that crawls inside fish's mouths, eats their tongue, and then anchors itself in their jaw like their tongue from now on and eats 10% of the food that comes in forevermore, which is just like parasite worlds are so freaky. They're all really tiny, but if they were blown up, it would just be like a nightmare world. <laughs> um, it's the best to think about, really. Um, my hair has gone crazy just thinking about how awesome it is. Um, ladies, this has been so, so much fun. Uh, I know that we've had so many kids today, so many great questions. I want to highlight a few quick things for our teachers before we let you guys go. One is, if you're keen on citizen science, one of the best ways to get involved in this to begin with uh, is something we use for our Backyard Bio Nature campaign, which are the iNaturalist and the Seek apps. They're incredible tools, so, so much fun. And anyone can download Seek and start exploring nature near that. If you want to find out more about Ocean Networks, our website, I brought it up numerous times, oceannetworks.ca to keep the excitement going. And specifically on Pacific Sea Maps, which we talked about a lot. Monica was kind enough to share that in the chat, so that's great. Um, and then some of our creatures today, there are four that really jumped out. Check out Mega Mouth Sharks, Japanese Spider Crabs, Hagfish, and Feather Stars. They'll all blow your minds. Um, I really encourage you guys to, to see those when you're done. Ladies, um, is there any last message you want to leave our, our horde of kids with today before we let you go? My message to you is don't be shy. You are welcome to participate in science, especially through Ocean Network's Canada page. Everything that's there is open to the public and just asking what's that w could change the face of science. So please don't be shy. Jennifer? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, it all starts with asking questions. So start asking questions about any, and there's no stupid questions. Um, and I also just want to um, reiterate, you can follow that Seamount expedition at hashtag Pacific Seamounts 2021. And there's also a link um, to follow the live stream as well that I put in the chat. Fantastic, everyone. So what we do at the end of every broadcast, I know it's your first time, so we're going to bring in all our classes and teachers to say a quick thank you and goodbye. Miss Lobb, Miss McCallum, Miss Truscott, Miss Moore and her horde of kids that are actually live. And Miss Woodchuck, welcome in, guys. Thank you so much, and have a wonderful rest of your day.